assistant professor. I'm a certified health and life coach, a well being ambassador for the Honors College for the past few years, where I've taught part time for the last 10 years and one of your wellness class educators. My email is avi.horton at ua.edu. So if you have any questions or just want to reach out, please feel free to do so. So our goals are to talk about sun safety, to discuss the importance of protecting your body while you're exposed to the sun, and then learning specific strategies and products that will help you be um, a little bit more aware about sun safety and best practices. So when I say sun safety, sometimes that makes us a little bit fearful. We oftentimes think about skin cancer, and that's certainly a possibility. Uh, we know that one in two people in their lifetime as adults in the U.S. will be diagnosed with some type of cancer. And so um, we have to be really you know, optimistic, I think, while being very realistic about our odds of um, facing a cancer diagnosis. And for young people, skin cancer is one of the most prevalent um, so it's important to know your risk factors and to take precautions. So this is just for educational purposes only. Obviously, it doesn't constitute medical advice. So we would always ask that you reach out to your healthcare provider. But we want you to focus on what you can control. Take what resonates with you and leave the rest. Remember that baby steps are important. Small progress is still progress. And reach out if you have questions. So. I love this graphic because I love being outdoors. I love being in the sun and I don't ever want people to be afraid of being outside and getting sun exposure because it's really helpful to the body and it's needed. So um, we are not made to live indoors. We are not made for fluorescent lighting and, um, you know, being in office spaces all of the time. And so the more you can get outside, the better, in my opinion. You just have to do a really good job of protecting your skin and being aware of your risk factors, like I mentioned. So when I'm outside, I am walking on sunshine, and I hope that y'all hear the song lyrics playing in the background, <laughs> you know, kind of, uh, you know, a summer anthem, if you will, uh, that we're all walking on sunshine, and it does feel good, hopefully. Um, I say that my family has a strong uh, history with skin cancers, and so one of my daughters is really, really afraid of being out in the sun, and so we've had to be really careful and kind of cautious about how we talk about sun safety and, and skin cancer um, because it's such a frightful thing for her, and um, thankfully my other children are not quite as concerned about it. Um, they have a healthy respect for the sun. And so if you have a, a situation where you have had skin cancer or a mole that has been, um, you know, a little bit um, concerning or you have a family history or you know someone who has had skin cancer, that can be very terrifying. Um, but we want to take some of that fear away. Because of the way that Teams operates and it's a little bit sometimes difficult to play some of the videos and then get back to our screens, I'm going to have you all just watch this couple minute video on sun safety from the CDC on your own time. But I think it's a really good one to kind of capture the main nuggets of what we want you to walk away with um, in a fun, quick little video. So that is there for you when you have time to just go and play it after the class. That can be your happy homework for the day. All right. So I hope that you will befriend the sun if you haven't already. Spending out time outside is so helpful for your physical and your mental health. You know, we talk about physical fitness all the time, but we really want you to think about your mental fitness as well. And so being outside, being physically active is good for your brain. It's good for your body. It helps reduce stress and it helps you get vitamin D. Most physicians today that I have talked with personally will say that you cannot, because of our environment, get enough vitamin D synthesis um, from being outdoors that most people need to supplement with vitamin D. So that's something that you want to ask your healthcare provider, well, whether it's an, an MD, whether it's your naturopathic doctor, your nurse practitioner, your physician's associate, whomever you're seeing for your healthcare, ask them about your vitamin D levels. Usually you can get vitamin D levels drawn every six months with our Blue Cross Blue Shield plan if your provider feels like it's warranted and it's an order that they put in. And so ask them about your vitamin D levels and see if supplementation would be good for you. Um, but still, I think it's always good to get the real thing instead of supplementation only. And so you, you may need to supplement. I supplement. I have to take a large dose of vitamin D once a week because mine is really low and I get out in the sun a lot. Um, but other factors like your overall physical health, your GI system, all of those things are going to play a role in how much sun you absorb. Um, so 
definitely think about um, your vitamin D status. You can work and play outside, uh, I think, comfortably without needlessly raising your skin uh, cancer risk factors by protecting your skin from the sun, both with SPF and sunscreen, but also with clothing. So we talk a lot about wearing sunscreen, but that's usually not enough. This, um, you know, kind of south in uh, in our world, we really need more than that, particularly if you're going to be around something that reflects. So a couple of questions we're asking about different factors in the environment. If you are on the water, so if you're in or near a pool, if you're you know, by any kind of body of water, like a lake, an ocean, if you're on sand or near sand, the reflective properties of the water and sand and even snow. So for those of you who like colder weather, um, even snow, when there's sunshine out, you can get a lot of that exposure because of the reflection. So those are three areas where you would need to be more cautious. Um, someone asked about, is it going to be more or less kind of harmful or dangerous if it's um, cloudy versus sunny. I think that obviously it depends on the individual and, and your exposure time, how long you're outside. Uh, but for people, I think a lot of times they'll get sunburned when they're maybe out on a cloudy day um, near a body of water or on the beach because they're not really as aware of how much sun they're getting and so they're actually not applying sunscreen as much maybe they're not hydrating as frequently because they're not so hot and so i think if you're not aware you could actually get more sun exposure on a cloudy day um, or get more dehydrated on the cloudy less hot day because you're just not paying attention to it as much and so i think it just has to do with your level of awareness and how proactive you're being so you always want to put your sunscreen on before going outside about 30 minutes before to let it dry um, and of course 30 minutes before you get into water is really important reapplying frequently if you're going to be in the water is also a good idea um, there are different things that you can use on your skin now there are little stickers that you can put on maybe your arm or your hand and when that sticker um, some of them are when they fade some of them are when they actually turn a different color it will tell you that you need to reapply because it's absorbing those um, UVA and VB rays and so it's telling you okay that has affected the sticker so now I need to put more sunscreen on those are really good I think especially for kids or maybe people who need a little bit more of a visual reminder that they need more sunscreen um, obviously once your skin starts to feel like it's burning a little bit you've probably overdone your sun exposure and so um, unfortunately it's probably going to be um, too late to wait until you notice that you feel a little burned or you look a little burned because it's going to take time, kind of like a, an old school photograph, it's going to take time for that to develop. And so you may feel fine, but when you go in for the day later in the evening, you realize, oh, I'm really burned. I don't feel good. And so that's kind of important to be more aware of that earlier on in the day. But most skin cancers are caused by too much exposure to UV light or ultraviolet light. And so um, it talks about the invisible kinds of radiation that you can get from the sun, but also from tanning beds and sun lamps and other um, forms of exposure, um, even things like red light, um, you know, depending on the type of red light it is or other types of, of lights that you can get in saunas and other treatments, you want to be aware of those. Um, also from using certain types of light with um, beauty products or um, you know, beauty interventions, you might go for a spa day, um, you want to ask them about the light and the protection. Obviously, if you have to wear protective eyewear, you probably need to be aware of the types of impacts that's having on your skin as well, um, because any of that could potentially damage the skin. And some of it in the beauty treatments, it actually the purpose is to damage your skin so that your skin will regenerate and make new cells and turn over old cells and things like that. So it's just important to be cautious about that. So protection from UV rays is important all year long, not just in the summer. Uh, so I know we often think about you know, during the summer, we need to be extra cognizant of it and we need to make sure we have plenty of sunscreen. But you really want to be aware, even in the winter sun, um, people who drive like trucks for a living or who um, are on the road a lot, uh, you know, you will often see because you get more sun coming in through your 
you know, driver's window, you'll see more issues on the left side of the body. So on the left arm and on the left side of the face because you're getting that light coming through and it's not getting filtered as much as it is on the right side. And so that's an important consideration that um, if you drive a lot, especially if you tend to put your arm in your window or put it up near the window, you may be getting a lot of harmful um, UV rays that way. So wearing sunscreen all year long is important and you can get those UV rays exposures on cloudy and cool days because it reflects off of the surfaces like I mentioned um, and even cement. I didn't mention that one, but cement and asphalt also can be um, a factor there as well. So in the continental United States, UV rays tend to be the strongest between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So a lot of times you'll say people um, you know, will want to be in the shade in the hottest part of the day. They're referring to 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., that time frame. Um, so you want to think about that. Some people will even say um, 9 to 3 is another range that you could um, consider. So just knowing that when it's the hottest part of the day for you, when the sun is the most overhead, the most direct, that's when you want to be extra cautious about your sun exposure. And wearing things like hats, and long sleeves or clothing that has SPF built into it is really helpful because you're only going to be able to protect your skin so much using a sunscreen. Having protective clothing is also really good. Light clothes, so clothes that are light in color like my little white jacket, um, things that are not going to absorb the sun as much like dark clothing will. Having something that's going to be away from the skin so that it doesn't stick to the skin is also really helpful. Um, you know, having fabrics that are really cooling in nature, having fabrics that are um, more natural, so not synthetic fabrics. Um, those are all going to be helpful things to consider when you're thinking about protecting yourself. Wearing sunscreen is helpful. Wearing sunglasses is helpful. Wearing hats is helpful. A lot of times people will have, especially if they work outdoors, uh, a lot of issues around the neck and on the ears, especially the backs of the ears. Um, so making sure that if you're outdoors for sports or on the water or you're cutting grass or maybe it's a part of your job to be outdoors, you want to make sure you're protecting those areas. We often don't think about the backs of the ears and the eyes and they're very, very sensitive. So you can look at the UV index to know what the risk factors are for that day in terms of um, UV ray exposure. And so if you have an index of three or higher in your area, it's even more important that you take extra steps to protect your skin. So the difference between UVA and UVB rays, they're just two different types of ultraviolet rays and both can be harmful to your skin. The UVA actually penetrates deep into the layers of the skin and can lead to premature signs of aging. So those fine lines and wrinkles that you might see around the eyes um, and the nose and the mouth. And then the UVB rays are the primary cause of things like sunburn because they penetrate the outer layer of the skin and actually cause that damage to the skin cells. And so that's what causes that melanin to develop, which gives us that nice suntan color if you do actually tan. Um, but you actually have to, you know, burn the layers of skin to get that melanin released. And so it's not an ideal situation for you, particularly if you do have a risk factor for skin cancer. So too much exposure can play a part in skin cancer. And, you know, knowing your risk factors is helpful. Um, on a cloudy day, about 80% of the sun's UVA rays actually still pass through the clouds. And so that's probably more than you recognize when you're outside enjoying the, the nicer, cooler weather. You're probably not thinking about it's really only a 20% reduction in your exposure. And then when you think about tanning beds, you know, that's primarily emitting the UVA rays. Um, which is going to penetrate deep into the skin. And so not only are you raising your risk factors, um, but usually when you're going to a tanning bed, it's because you do care about your appearance. And, you know, you may really value a tan um, years ago, 20 years plus ago, if you had things like psoriasis or arthritis or other skin disorders. Um, some doctors would actually recommend that you go to the tanning bed for those conditions because they thought that the the light could be helpful. Um, so we have definitely changed our stance on that in the medical community. But I actually received that advice as a teenager because I had 
um, psoriasis and eczema and so and psoriatic arthritis and so I actually was told to go to the tanning bed a couple of times a week and so um, that created an unhealthy habit that has led to um, the last five or so years of having more than 20 moles removed because of skin and mole changes um, and I'm sure it was not only the tanning beds but also probably my sun exposure as a child if you have a sun exposure or sunburn that damages the skin as an, an elementary school preteen in that age range um, of your childhood, then you are more likely to develop skin cancer later on in life. And so that's important to really know and think about protecting our kids. So this is just a graphic that shows how deep the levels go. So UVA, aging and wrinkles, it's going down into that third layer, the hypodermis skin layer. The epidermis is what we see, what we can feel, and then the next layer is the dermis and then the hypodermis. And so this shows you where the UVB rays are just burning. So I think B burning, and that's that outer layer epidermis. So hopefully this is a helpful graphic. I'm a visual person, so I really like any time I can see what is being explained to me. So this is the index here. So it looks at the UV index levels and anything that's in the medium to the high category. So three and above is where you're going to have the extra protection that's needed. But obviously, it's always a good thing to have a little bit of protection in terms of eyewear. So having your sunglasses and then also at least having a hat or some sunscreen available if you know you're going to be outside because um, everything can change, you know, um, and vary throughout the day. So definitely be aware. And uh, you can download apps or other weather apps that will include this information. So you can just do a quick Google search and find one that works best for you. Um, sometimes on the screens on your computers, um, you actually can get uh, an alert that will come to your Outlook or that will be displayed on the toolbar on the bottom of your computer. Uh, so I have that at home. Uh, I didn't intend to do that, but it was just a feature that I noticed on my computer. It actually gives me the index and the weather. And so that's a really helpful thing to know as you're getting ready for the day. So steps towards sun safety. Always try to seek shade. I know it's more fun to be out and um, you know to kind of be in the mix of things to be in the pool to be at the lake to be at the beach or you know out on the field if you're watching you know sports or something like that or you know participating with things with your kids but if you can be in the shade that's really helpful again it's another layer of protection um, so your clothing your sunscreen your eyewear and then being in the shade so finding some trees or an umbrella or something else that's going to give you a little bit of shade and shelter is really helpful clothing like i mentioned you know making sure that you um, cover up for a part of the day if you're going to be out especially if you're going to be in a swimsuit that is very very painful to have a sunburn i'm sure we probably all experienced that um, but you want to make sure that you um, take clothes that are going to actually cover and protect against the the rays it may not have spf in it but any type of protection is better than no protection so just think about that you also can have clothing that's certified under international standards for offering uv protection and i'll give you a couple of suggestions for that at the end all right let's see skipped ahead so um your hat so hats i mentioned there are some hats that actually have uh, a UV protection built in that it has SPF and it's the way that the fabric is actually constructed and so that's helpful a lot of times people will just wear a baseball hat or a baseball cap and feel like that that's fine but you need something that's going to actually have a brim on it that goes all the way around so that you're protecting your neck and your nose a lot of times if you're wearing a baseball cap it's only protecting the upper part of your face and your nose and your chin which are going to be the two most prominent parts of your face are not protected and it's not protecting your ears um, and then sunglasses like i mentioned that's going to be helpful to protect your eye health and um, you want to make sure that you don't get sunburns in your eyes i have actually had family members and friends who have had um, damage to their eyes and who have had sunburns to their um, sclera and their retinas because they um, were outside for prolonged periods of time they were near reflective water and sand they didn't have a hat or sunglasses on 
and um, that was really damaging to their health. And sometimes that's temporary and reversible, but sometimes it isn't. And so I think that's especially true when we think about kids. A lot of times we have kids outside and they don't have hats or sunglasses on. And so they may not even have the, the language or the ability to tell you that their eyes hurt or that they're burning. And if they mention that, you may not even think that it could be because of a sunburn. So um, definitely know that that's something that you would want to, if you are concerned about it, to have it checked out by an ophthalmologist, your you know child's pediatrician, what have you, because it's so difficult to kind of determine sometimes what's actually causing a discomfort in a child, especially if they're younger and they're not able to communicate that to you. I'm going to go back and make sure I didn't skip. Good. Okay. Um, so that's just something to consider. Another note about sunglasses, though, is that it's really helpful in the morning before 10 a.m. to like drive to work without your sunglasses on. If you see me driving around town, you're going to see me wearing sunglasses because my eyes are very sensitive. But for five to 10 minutes on my drive in, I do try to take them off. Um, especially as I'm getting started and getting out um, the door, I try to leave my sunglasses just on the top of my head and not put them on right away because getting morning sunlight is really helpful to resetting your circadian rhythm that helps control your sleep and your hormonal cycle. And so it's not a good thing to always have sunglasses on 24 seven if you're outside um, and to never get natural light in your eyes. It's a healthy thing to do, but you just want to make sure that you're not directly looking at the sun. Um, obviously, that you work up to that if you are really sensitive, and that it's just for five or ten minutes to let you get that really good reset every morning. Um, and again, before 10 a.m., not only because of your circadian cycle, but also just to protect you from the sun's um, ultraviolet exposure. So, some more information here about SPFs. You know. Dermatologists usually will tell you to use a broad spectrum sunscreen um, with at least SPF 15. Some will even say 35. Most dermatologists are going to have a particular sunscreen that they recommend, a particular SPF that they like to use, um, but they're all going to tell you to use a broad spectrum sunscreen and talk about the reapplication process. So knowing that sunscreen wears off quickly, especially near, near water or when you're out and you're kind of sweating or you're toweling off a lot, that at least every two hours you're going to reapply your sunscreen. And then always check the expiration date. Um, sunscreens without an expiration date usually don't have a shelf life more than three years. Uh, but for me, especially some of the sunscreens that we've seen in the past year that have been recalled, um, because of you know, carcinogens that have been found in the sunscreens, a lot of times those don't last past the season. So if you have some leftover at the end of summer and you think, I'm just going to hang on to that until next summer and it'll be fine. Um, and it's really expensive, so it's very tempting to do that. A lot of times it's not expired, but it does not work as well. Um, so you just want to know that if you do that, <laughs> Please don't put it on your kids, but also make sure that you're really aware that it might not be as effective as it was the summer before. Say you may need to re reapply it more often than every two hours, or you may just need to throw it out and get a new bottle. So think about that. Um, most adults need at least one ounce of sunscreen to cover their body. So just a really healthy um, squirt. Some people will actually say like a um, quarter or a half dollar size amount obviously depending on you know the amount of skin and surface area you're trying to cover um, that will make a difference as well even if you're planning on you know wearing a hat and you're going to have sunglasses on and you're going to have you know a pool cover up or a t-shirt or something on or a rash guard which i think are really really great especially for kids to wear um, spf protected rash guards are our friends all my kids wear those in the summer um, and it's a habit they don't mind wearing it because we started them out wearing them as babies um, then still apply sunscreen and then put those cover-ups and things on because that's just adding layers to your protection. And then 15 to 30 minutes is usually um, what we say to let it dry before going outside. I always say at least 30 um, because you need at least 30 minutes before you get into water because it will wash off for sure. And don't forget your lips. So your lips, your eyes, your ears, uh, those are going to be places that you want to make sure. Even your scalp, especially if you are sensitive or you have thin hair, even if you have a hat on, you can still get that light exposure. So there's um, balms and sticks and things that you can actually rub into your scalp to protect your scalp. Um, you can have lip balms that have SPF. So don't forget about those things either. 
And then I always say to try to avoid the spray sunscreens like the aerosol cans. Um, one, it tends to get on your neighbor. I'm sure everyone has probably been at the lake or the pool or the beach and your neighbor has started to spray the aerosol sunscreen and it gets all over you and everyone else. Um, so there's that factor, but also um, it's not the safest for our lungs to be breathing in aerosol sprays. So anything that's aerosolized, I would say to try to find a spray or a lotion that can replace that because it's just not the healthiest for our lungs or our overall health. So some other things to consider just, you know, again, being a visual person, this is just a good little graphic that you can kind of hold on to. Some of the information on this varies a little bit like SPF 30 instead of the 35 that I mentioned or, you know, it says 11 to 3 where I said, you know, 10 to 4. But this gives you a general idea of the things that you need to think about. I'm definitely hydrating. So while you're putting on your sunscreen, making sure that people are drinking at least a glass or two of water before going outside and keeping that constantly refilled. Um, and then all of the other protective measures that we mentioned are kind of outlined here for you. So just a nice little screenshot for you. And these slides will be available to y'all. So when you're driving, I mentioned about the left arm and left side of your face exposure. I also want to say to take shorter showers. So if you're taking really hot showers that blanch your skin or turn it a different color because you've been outside, um, you know, and, and you're wanting to kind of shower off or things like that, it's really good. Anytime you're sweating, you want to make sure you immediately take a shower when you come inside because your sweating is your natural detox. And so you don't want that to reabsorb into your skin. But you want to make sure that your showers are kind of lukewarm. They're not too hot. They're not too cold. The Goldilocks principle. And, you know, five to 10 minutes, especially five minutes if they're really hot showers, um, because you will get rid of the natural oils in your skin if you shower too much, too often, um, you know, too long, too hot. That's going to strip the natural oils in your skin and in your hair. And um, it's going to make all of that look and appear dull, but it's also going to cause issues with um, your skin integrity. So your skin is not going to be as protected from the sun and other harmful things because you don't have those natural oils um, because your skin is dried out. And so it just leaves you at risk. Um, you want to avoid hot water as much as you can. And I'm saying this, if you know me in real life, you know that I love a hot shower. So um, so I have to be really mindful of that as well um, to keep the sho showers kind of limited in that way. But use a moisturizing lotion after you shower. So you might want to keep your lotion in your shower and then put it on before you even dry your skin. So, you know, you can kind of, you know, use the towel to, you know, lightly get the biggest amount of water off of your skin, but while it's still a little damp, apply your lotion and that will help it be more effective. And then we always say to drink half of your body weight in ounces a day, but usually no more than 128 ounces. Um, and that's about four to eight ounces of water per hour while you're awake. And that's a good rule of thumb um, to make sure that you're staying really hydrated, but not overly so. So skin cancer risk, uh, it's mentioned that the new rate has come out that one in two Americans will develop some type of cancer. Right now, it's one in five Americans will develop skin cancer during their lifetime. And tanning bed use before age 35 increases your risk for skin cancer by 75%. And, and unfortunately, I'm in that category. I've had precancerous moles. Um, so people who use tanning beds are two and a half times more likely to develop squamous cell carcinoma. Mine actually was precancer for melanoma, which is the most severe type. You also have, um, in addition to, to melanoma and squamous cell, you also have basal cell carcinoma. Um, and those are the two more common. All skin cancer is, um, you know, is something to be, uh, you know, monitored closely because of the risk factors that are associated, um, but particularly with melanoma because it can become uh, systemic and it has poor health outcomes. And I say that to empower you, not to scare you. Uh, your risk of skin cancer doubles if you've had five plus sunburns. And I will just be very frank with you and say that I would have five plus sunburns in a summer. And I think probably a lot of us would have um, if we look back and, and kind of note that. I don't think that I'm in the minority in that statistic, unfortunately. And that's why we see so many people with skin cancer today. So 90% of pediatric melanoma cases are actually in young girls ages 10 to 19. And depending on if you're 
male or female. And again, I think this is a behavioral thing, but I also think it's hormonal. And in medicine, most studies are done with male and female. It does not recognize, um, you know, the uh, other, you know, gender uh, roles or, or transitions or things like that. Unfortunately, it, it's just in the, the gender binary. Um, so that's why I'm reporting it in that way. But one American dies every hour from melanoma, and it's the most common cancer among women ages 25 to 29. And it takes about 28 days for new skin cells to grow. So when you're thinking about um, skin cancer, skin cancers can develop very rapidly because the skin cancer cells um, attached to the skin cell itself is going to be something that will grow very quickly. So it's important that, you know, a few days can make a big difference in a melanoma diagnosis. And I'll share a story about that in just a second. There are 2 million non-melanoma cases of cancer diagnosed every year in the U.S., and that number is growing, um, like I mentioned. So my husband was diagnosed with melanoma uh, more than 10 years ago, and um, he has gone on to have basal and squamous cell carcinoma. And we happened to just have um, a friend of ours who's a dermatologist recognize that he had a mole that was concerning. I had mentioned it to him and he said, oh, well, I have a dermatology appointment in another month. It can wait. And we just happened to see our dermatologist before then. And she said, um, you know, when we followed up, we uh, had a call from her office uh, on the Monday after we saw her on the Saturday and said, we're going to move your appointment up. Come on in to see us. And so she did a biopsy and walked him through everything. And it did come back that it was melanoma. And it had metastasized to his uh, lymph nodes. And he had a couple of surgeries and radiation treatment and, and all of that to follow up. And he has gone on to have basal and squamous cell um, cancer diagnoses as well. Another one this summer, in fact. And so it's been an ongoing 10 year plus experience with him. And I say that because it's so important to be empowered and not scared. And, um, you know, we have overcome a lot of the odds when it comes with my moles and with his cancer diagnosis that having education, being proactive, going and getting regular skin checks can really make a difference. And so if you know someone who's having a health scare or, you know, a cancer experience that is upsetting, just know that you still have power to make healthy choices and to make different choices. So if you've been someone who hasn't paid attention to your skin or hasn't been wearing, uh, you know, sunglasses and hats and sunscreen and protective clothing, every choice that you make will really make a huge difference in your long-term outcomes in terms of your health or avoiding a cancer diagnosis. So it's never too late to make a healthy choice. Uh, and it's never too late to educate yourselves and others about, um, you know, moving forward, this is what I'm going to do to protect my skin, even in the past, if you're like me, that you didn't do that as diligently. So I hope that encourages somebody today. These are some examples of the different types of skin cancers and what they look like. I will say the basal cell carcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma look very much like this in the beginning stages. Um, this melanoma, I'm not going to say that it's more advanced. I think you can see with the pixelation that it's zoomed in a little bit more than these other two images. Um, but a lot of times it will actually come back as melanoma before it looks this severe. Um, so I've had one. My husband's also that was diagnosed was not nearly this dark. It was about half of this dark color. And so I don't want you to think that it has to be this black, dark, you know, red highlighted color for it to be melanoma. It doesn't. This is kind of the worst case scenario look here. Um, so just know that if you have a concern about a mole, just get someone to check it. Get your um, general practitioner, get your nurse practitioner, get a dermatologist, even plastic surgeons will look at those because a lot of times, depending on where the mole is, a plastic surgeon will actually remove the mole instead of a dermatologist. Um, so I've had mine removed by a dermatologist and a plastic surgeon. It just depended on their availability and where the mole was and how much work was going to have to be done. Was it a superficial mole or was it a really deep cut? And so um, just know that that's going to vary. But any of those folks can at least give you an opinion and send you on to someone else if they feel like it warrants that. So just some information about what skin cancers look like. 
Um, again, when you look at um, male and female, again, this is how the data is reported. Um, for females, you're going to have more people who have them on their legs. So women tend to have them more on the backs of their legs, um, maybe even possibly on their feet. So you can have them in your fingernails and toenails, little skin cancer spots that you don't really recognize as that. Um, so it's important that when you go and get a skin check that they look at your fingernails and your toenails and look in the areas that you can't see yourself. So your back, your trunk, your backs of your legs, the places that are the most difficult for you to see with your own eyes. Um, and then for men, they tend to have them on their actual trunk. So meaning more like the tops of their chest, their abdomen and their back. Um, so that's something to be, you know, considered of women that are going to be having more on their arms and then men more on their head and their neck. And my husband's was actually on the side of his neck and his shirt collar actually hit it a lot of the times when he was going for just regular checkups and visits and things. And so having that shirt collar um, right there at his neck, that's a place you really want to look at with people who wear shirt collars um, because it's not just about direct skin exposure. Oddly enough, for melanoma, a lot of times they're going to be in places where you don't get as much direct sunlight. And there's some research that says that there may be something to do with hormones, particularly people who have a lot of estrogen on board. And that makes sense because we have a lot of what we call xenoestrogens. Uh, it's X-E-N-O estrogens, things that mimic estrogen. So our exposure to plastics and chemicals and things like that can unnaturally elevate our estrogen in our bodies that we make. And so that would make sense that if this connection truly becomes something that we see in the literature that's supported over the next few years, after they replicate studies, that it may have something to do with our hormones and not just strictly our sun exposure. So something to consider as we think about it. And so you also want to know your ABCDEs. Um, there's actually a move to add an F on the end of this for funny looking. And so we'll talk about that. Um, my students, when I teach this to them, always uh, laugh and think that that's a fun way to remember that it's just funny looking, but a symmetry. So you want to make sure that when you look at your moles, that they're they're pretty symmetrical. That's how a mole, you know, quote unquote, should look that the border is not uneven. So you want it to be a nice round color. You saw on that other mole that was melanoma, um, it very much looked like that uneven border and it wasn't symmetrical. So you couldn't draw a line and fold it onto itself. Um, they can be brown, tan, or black. You usually see them looking very dark or black, but a lot of times it's a dark brown color with a black spot to start. And so that's really important to kind of look for. So you're looking at asymmetry, border, color, diameter. If it's larger than a pencil eraser, I happen to have a pencil. So if it's larger than a pencil eraser, then you're probably going to want to keep an eye on that. Uh, you also want to look at evolution. So does it change in size, shape, color, elevation, meaning when you rub your finger across it, can you feel that it's raised? Some moles will feel raised, some will not, but you want to know if it changes. And then any other traits or symptoms or things, um, some of the moles I just had two removed recently um, on the back of my shoulder in the spring and the reason that I knew that I needed to go and have them seen about is because when I would touch the mole it actually would be painful and there was a redness that was developing around the outside around the border of that mole and so I had those two removed and biopsied to make sure that they're you know were caught early and they were so that was a good thing but it was a just a, a painful spot and I noticed that my shoulder felt like it was hurting a little bit, but I didn't realize it was from the mole. And so I pointed to the spot and let my husband look and I was like, is there something there? Because it feels very tender and a little painful. It was starting to cause like a little bit of an ache and you wouldn't ever think to attribute that to a mole. And he said, well, there's a mole there that looks like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, I probably need to have that seen about. And so the surgeon agreed. So you may think you are having like an, a shoulder ache or a, a ache somewhere else in your body, and it may actually be from a mole or from a spot there. So, I mean, you can develop melanoma where you have extra melanin that has deposited that isn't actually a mole, but usually it is a mole. So sun poisoning is something that you also want to be aware of. I actually had sun poisoning on a spring break trip in high school. 
and developed blisters. And so you want to know about the levels of burns. Um, you can have um, different variations of skin burns that can become very serious because when you do have that level where you're developing the blisters, you can get very, very dehydrated and you can start to become very sick. You can get toxic. You can develop a fever, nausea, dizziness, um, all of the things that you would think of when you're you know, kind of fighting off an infection. You're more at risk for infections on your skin and in your body when your skin integrity has been compromised. So if you have redness to this degree or blisters to this degree, you do need to be seen by a provider because they need to be able to monitor the level of burn that you have and make sure you know that's not a second or third degree burn and that you don't need fluids or to be monitored in a hospital situation. So more information about how to prevent sun exposure and sun poisoning in this way. Um, you're more likely to do this um, type of burn if you've had it before or if you're using a suntan bed or if um, you're at a place that is going to have a lot of reflective qualities. But some people are just more susceptible to developing those blisters. And once you've had sun poisoning, you're more likely to have sun poisoning in the future. So sunburns, sun poisoning, heat rash, and heat exhaustion. It's important to know about those. You can also have heat stroke, which is more serious than heat exhaustion. So we talked about burns a lot. Heat rash, sometimes it's just that you develop a rash because you are so hot and you're sweating so much. Sun poisoning, I just mentioned that on the previous slide. And then heat exhaustion is where you just become noticeably tired, thirsty, lightheaded. You start to feel, you know, kind of poorly. You have, you know, maybe redness in your face that could look like a sunburn. And then heat stroke is when you have really overheated your body and you're dehydrated. And both heat exhaustion and heat stroke are considered medical emergencies. I would say personally, sun poisoning is right there with those because it can develop so quickly and you can get sick so fast. Um, so definitely know um, that those are serious and you need to kind of be mindful of them. So protect your eyes, your ears, your lips, your nose, your scalp, and the back of your neck. Your eyes and eyelids can sunburn, like I mentioned. I love using BioTrue drops to help lubricate your eyes. Uh, I tried them out. I thought they worked really well considering other products that I've tried that's just over the counter. And my ophthalmologist agreed that BioTrue are a good um, eye drop for most people who need some extra lubrication. Once you get into your late 30s, early 40s and beyond, you start to develop some natural dryness. And I'm definitely there. And so um, that's something that's been helpful. It can be really helpful, too, if you um, are having eye strain or things like that. I would not put those eye drops in if you feel like you have sunburn until you've been told by your ophthalmologist or physician to do that. Um, but just know that that might be a good option for you. And then with the sunscreen situation, you still want to get outside and get some sun without sunscreen just for that vitamin D synthesis. So you're going to hear, you know, 15 to 30 minutes is a good recommendation of sun first thing in the morning before 10 a.m. So go outside without your sunscreen, without your sunglasses and get a couple of, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, um, a few times a week, if not every day before you go into work so that you can get the health benefits of the sun without some of the concerns and worry over that. Be mindful of medications that you take or other conditions that make you prone to being sensitive to the sun or having photosensitivity. Uh, things like hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril, some um, heart and blood pressure medications like that will make you sensitive to the sun and you will burn much more quickly. Also, if you've delivered a baby and had um, a change in your hormones recently, that will make you more susceptible. So new mamas who go out who've never had sunburns, that's never been an issue for them. And they, you know, maybe have had a baby within the last two to three months. Sometimes their hormones will be such that it will make them more susceptible to sunburns. And so that's important to know. I did not learn that until I was going to my regular vacation and had just had a set of twins and I burned and I had done all the things I normally did and, and you know, normally don't have a sunburn to that degree and um, learned the hard way that that is something that plays a factor with your hormones. So check your nail beds. Like I mentioned, the bottoms of your feet especially um, can be an important place to look 
and just often places that you don't think about to see moles or um, that have sunlight, you know, we always think the sunlight areas are going to be the places that you're going to see those spots the most often. A lot of times with melanoma, that's not the case. So special considerations, um, you know, late stage melanoma diagnoses, along with almost every other health outcome, is going to disproportionately um, affect people who are um, in, you know, a vulnerable or marginalized group. So people who are of Asian or Hispanic or African American populations, um, you know, they are, tend to be less at risk for developing skin cancer because they have darker melanin, but they also then are screened less for those conditions. So when they do develop, because it doesn't prevent them from developing skin cancer, then when it does develop, sometimes that is actually going to be later stages of diagnosis because it wasn't caught early. So um, my message is that we just have to do our due diligence to make sure that we're screening everyone for everything that they are risk factors for. And so um, again, having darker skin tones does not prevent cancer from happening. Unfortunately, though, it could mean that it delays their diagnosis and their care. So we need to make sure that we get the word out to our communities to really take care of those um, who may not know that, you know, that they need to have extra screenings or that they need to be extra vocal about that and that they also need to be screening their skin. So um, again, more likely to see it on the feet, the palms, the toes, the fingers, the toenails and the fingernails, especially on darker skinned individuals. It tends to be um, in those areas where you're going to see um, the most likely because that's going to be where the pigmentation is probably going to be a little lighter on those folks. So just something to be, um, you know, considerate of as you think about your own risk factors. Okay, so see a dermatologist. I think it's important to schedule one annually. So I just had mine in June. And because of some concerning spots, I will be going back every six months now, which is pretty typical if you start to see um, developments and things like that. So that's not a concern. That's just them doing their due diligence. So a yearly check is really good. Um, if you have risk factors or you have to start having moles removed, every six months is pretty common. And then for people like my husband who've had multiple types of skin cancer and melanoma diagnosis, usually those folks are seen every three months or as needed. So that's kind of the schedule of doing skin checks. But you should do a skin check at least once a month. I always tell people to do that around your birthday. So I was born on the 12th of the month. So around the 12th of each month, I try to do my skin checks. So your self breast exam, your um, self testicular exam, your skin check, all of those good checks that you do, just do them around your birthday. And then that will remind you that, hey, it's time for me to check all my health. Have someone else look at the areas like your back, your thighs, your scalp. Um, if you don't trust their judgment, have them take a picture of it. So anytime I find a mole or a spot, I'll get someone um, to take a picture of it for me so that I can actually see it too. And I think that's really, really helpful. It also helps your provider track any changes as well. Know your risk factors. Share that information with your healthcare provider. Um, do you have behavioral risk like you go out without protection? Do you have a family history like I have of melanoma? Um, my granddaddy uh, died from complications of melanoma. And so, um, you know, that increases my risk significantly. Do I have a previous diagnosis or concern? Are there environmental risks? So am I working outdoors or am I around things that are going to cause me to have extra exposure? Those are the kinds of things that you want to ask yourself. So some products that I like to recommend. Again, everyone's going to have a different one that they recommend. Our dermatologist recommends for my husband to use Neutrogena 100 plus for him particularly. Um, it is not my favorite. It's not a super clean product and I try to be really mindful of that. So I prefer Beauty Counter um, 30 SPF and I also prefer Super Goop, which is one that a lot of dermatologists and, uh, you know, skin specialists and um plastic surgeons are recommending. So super goop is one that you see a lot. If you're on Instagram and TikTok, you see it all the time, but it is the new latest kind of rage in, um, in sun protection. So that's also a really good one too. Um, things like Beauty Counter are mineral sunscreen, and so they are going to be a lot thicker. They're also not going to be as effective as blocking the sun as something like a Neutrogena 100 plus. Um, so you have to figure out what works best for you and everyone is going to respond differently. So you just have to test out a few um, and make sure that when you do test them out, that you're going to just be doing some light yard work, that you're not going out for a, a day at the lake or the pool or the beach, but 
you're just going to be in and out so that you can see how your skin does. If you're super sensitive or allergic to things, you may want to test out a spot on your arm before you even do like a full body check of it. You also can download Think Dirty's app that looks at the different types of sunscreens. Again, the cleaner in terms of like clean products that you use, the more you're going to have to apply it, the more expensive it's going to be, and the more likely you are that you could get burned because you're not going to just be able to slather it on and go and not worry about it because they're not going to be as effective as blocking the sun. So you just have to make sure that you do a good balance. Um, you know, for me, I still feel like I can get away with a natural sunscreen and being mindful for my husband with his numbers of, of diagnoses and things and his progression. We feel like he needs to, to do the Neutrogena 100 plus to protect his skin a little bit better. So um, it's a very, very individual choice. Okay. Um, there's also this app, like I mentioned, the Think Dirty app and the Environmental Working Group. They have an app and a website where you can go and check out your products. If you're interested in clean products, we have a couple of classes on clean living lifestyle one and two. So I would encourage you all, if you're thinking about making changes in your health, to check those classes out. They are on our archived webinar page on wellness.ua.edu. A couple of things I like to use, Lavaderm after sun spray from Young Living helps a lot if you accidentally get a little bit of a burn. BioCool is not clean or green in terms of a product, but it works extremely well, but it does have lidocaine. So you do not want to put this near your heart. I do not put this on my kids because it does have lidocaine in it. It is over the counter, but you just have to really use with caution because lidocaine can impact um, your breathing and your heart rate and all of that. But it does, it's a numbing agent. So it does take some of the numbness out of the burn. Lavaderm does that too with natural ingredients. And then of course, you've got the good old aloe vera gel. And then lavender, if you're using a therapeutic medical grade lavender essential oil like Young Living has, there's several other brands out there. Lavender can be really soothing and can help take the burnout as well. But you also have this company here, um, and it is going to be an all natural product that you can use to protect your skin from uh, any type of, you know, sun exposure. It's going to have SPF built in. It's lightweight, you know, very natural fabricated uh, materials in terms of hats and clothing that you can use for men and for women and you know lots of great choices there this is the brand that our dermatologist recommended for my husband and my family to use um, and it's backed by many dermatologists nationally so that's another great product that you can use all right I hope that that was helpful I'm going to go to your questions this is our social media so our website our Facebook Instagram and blog and Carolyn and Miranda and the whole team at Wellness and Work Life do a great job of maintaining all of those sites and social media outlets for us. This is my contact information. And I'm going to pop y'all's chat back up and look to see what all we can answer. At one o'clock, you're free to go, but I will stay around and answer your questions. So preferred sunscreen and SPF, I would say Super Goop um, 35 plus. I think we answered the question about cloudy days. They're, they can be as dangerous for sure. Hotter days and cooler days, again, um, you're more at risk for hotter days, but the cooler days might make you think that you're okay. Um, the question about spray and aerosol or lotion, I always think lotion's better because it's thicker. Spray would be the next best and then try to avoid aerosol. The timing of sunscreen and reapplying, so 30 minutes before you go out, especially if you're getting in water, reapply at least every two hours. Uh, zinc, benzene. I like having ones with um, zinc. So sunscreens that have the zinc in it are going to be thicker and going to be more natural. Um, and it gives you a good coating. But I think the jury is still out on what is truly a safe sunscreen, given everything we've learned about the carcinogens and the popular um, sunscreens that we've all used and we've all grown up using. Um, particular brands, I think you just have to find what works best for you. Um, I really like Beauty Counter um, if I'm not going to be out more than a couple of hours. And um, yeah, even in the early morning or even late at night at the beach, you still need the sunscreen. We ride a motorcycle sunscreen or long sleeves, both. I would use both sunscreen and long sleeves. And I would use long sleeves to protect you because if you have a fall on your motorcycle, 
you want to make sure that you have a cotton fabric because if you have a synthetic fabric, I'm going way off script, y'all. But if you have a synthetic fabric on and you have a motorcycle accident, sometimes that synthetic fabric will actually stick to the skin and make it harder for you if you get like road burn or something like that. It will actually stick in the skin. So you want something like cotton or ideally like some type of leather that's going to protect your skin if you were to have a fall from the motorcycle. Um, but then also that's going to help protect you for sunscreen. So um, and sunburns. So good. Wondering about spray versus lotion. Definitely lotion expire. We said the three years specific sunglasses. Make sure your sunglasses have UVA and UVB protection. The sunglasses should tell you that it should have a sticker. And I don't have a particular one, but if you find that you have one that you really like, please let us know, Brett. That's a good, good question. I don't have a favorite though. Um, I believe darker colored clothing is better to prevent sunburn. It depends on the type of fabric and the colors. You know, traditionally they say that black and dark clothes actually absorb more um, but it depends on the type of fabric. It depends on um, the specific color of the fabric. Um, so lighter color clothes are going to help you in terms of reflecting some of that off and keeping you cooler. But really, we want to make sure that it's got some SPF protection. And most SPF protective clothing is going to be the lighter colors, the light blues, the light um, whites and greens and things like that. So um, yes, there's definitely debate about that. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, sunscreen, yeah, do not leave sunscreen outside. Don't leave it in your car. You don't want it to get too hot. Um, oh, thank you for sharing about your melanoma diagnosis. Yeah, she says not a fun time. I'm sure not. Another one, another participant says melanoma 20 years ago this month. Well, I'm so glad that you're here with us to share your story and um, thank you. Hopefully this has been helpful. If you have dark skin, we mentioned about that. Treatment for sunburn, you can get actual treatment at a hospital for that. They treat it like a regular burn. And so, um, you know, it'll be things like um, keeping your skin moist. It'll be things like uh, hydration, getting IVs potentially if you're really dehydrated. Um, and it'll be avoiding, you know, the sun, obviously, hot water, super cold water. Um, and there might even be like needs for pain medications and things like that. So um, that could be a potential. Uh, you know, sometimes they're going to just give you over the counter medications at home. It depends on how severe. Brands for kids, anything that's good for an adult would be probably good for a child as long as, you know, you're not using aerosolized sprays or things like that. Aloe, really good for a sunburn. I still think that there's a lot of debate about that, but it certainly feels good when you are burned. So I think if it feels good um, and it's not harmful or toxic, you're not allergic, you know, I think that it's, it's okay to try. We definitely use aloe vera sometimes. Um, I prefer the Bio Cool if I accidentally get a burn, but all my kids, I do use aloe vera and I think it's fine as long as there's no reason for you particularly not to use it. People who have eczema and compromised skin, more specific care, keeping your skin covered, keeping it protected, keeping it um, dry, uh, you know, using sunscreen as needed, um, and then follow-up care about your eczema. That's really important because there's some new products out now. I've had eczema and psoriasis since I was in elementary school, and I am now free of both of those. Um, I had one little spot left, and this summer I got a new treatment with my dermatologist, and I'm completely free of that. So continuously getting updates on your care is important because so many strides are being made in treatment today. I see that swim, but I'm still going to keep on answering your questions. Thank you for the information. Good. I'm so glad this was helpful. Can you be allergic to the sun? You can be allergic to the sun, but I also think that you can be allergic to sunscreen. So um, some people who get uh, sun poisoning actually are having a reaction to the sun hitting the sunscreen. So make sure it's not her sunscreen. And you might want to talk to her healthcare provider to see if there's something else going on, because usually there's another underlying issue or other underlying allergy that could be causing that info, that that reaction or that inflammation or, or whatever ex she's experiencing. So it could be an inflammatory issue or autoimmune something going on. It doesn't have to be super serious. It could just be sunscreen. But I would definitely if it were my 15 year old, I would definitely take her in and see. But I wouldn't be overly concerned about it. I'm just a protective mama. Yeah, so we have a new person um, to UA. So glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Your uh, attendance will automatically be taken care of by Miranda. So you are good. No need to do anything. 
All right, I think I got to everyone's question. I hope that was helpful. If you had another question or follow up, feel free to email me. It's abby.horton at ua.edu. I hope you'll have a great rest of your day and don't be afraid of the sun. Go out and get some good sunshine, some good vitamin D. Um, enjoy the last few weeks of summer. Thanks so much, y'all. Bye.